recommend editing that material on this project? Um, that's a great question. Actually, you know, as some of you guys may know, the during this time period in the 90s, it was pretty anti-documentary. working on the La Tigra tour film documentary, um, Who Took the Bomb, which is so fun and amazing. And um, so we were at, she, she stopped by this post-production house that I was working at, and she said, you know, I'm going to do this, and I was just like, that sounds great, and she wanted to find out if I might be interested, and I, I just, you know, I, I just said, I think it's, you know, I think it's time that you need to, you need to tell your story. I think it's awesome that La Tigra film is going to come out, but I really want to hear your story. And, um, and a couple of weeks later, she asked me to meet her over at her um, art studio in, um, in Chinatown and was like totally nervous because she really does a great job of putting all of the people that she works with kind of in front of her. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm making this cool stuff, but look at all my friends that made it, you know? And um, so I don't feel like as for such a strong personality, she's not somebody who steps in front a lot. So I think she was a little nervous about it, and she said, I think I can do it. If you can make it, I can do it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll quit my job, and let's do that. And uh, we're about to be joined by Kathleen. <laughs> Everybody, thanks so much for watching the movie. This is um, producer Tamara Davis who worked with us. Um, I, I, I'm going to ask you the same question, actually, that I just asked Cindy. Um, what were, you know, from your angle, what were your feelings about being uh, asked to participate in this kind of documentary when Cindy came to you? Um, so let's do this. Um, well, in keeping with the honesty theme. <laughs> of the movie um, and telling the truth. I was really ill and um, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I had no idea what I had. I didn't know if I had MS or lupus or um, what was going on with my body or if I was gonna end up in a wheelchair and able to talk. Um, and I really wanted to make sure that my work was existed in the world because I'm that kind of freak. And um, so when Cindy asked me, I don't think if it was at any other time, I would have said yes, because it's a really scary, embarrassing, um, vulnerable process. And um, in a way, it was great that I was sick, um, because I said yes. Um, I, I guess now I'd like to open the floor to folks that uh, would like to ask questions of uh, Kathleen and the filmmakers. Uh, does anyone uh, out there have a question ready to go? Yeah. Yep. What was the time frame of the interviews? Like, when did you start the interviews? 
Yeah, so the question is about the time frame of the interviews and when, when that process began and until uh, when you finished. July 4th, uh, 2010 to July 4th, 2011. See anybody else out there with a question? Very American Hulk movie. You know. Yes, in the back. Yeah, the question is about uh, whether there's going to be a ton of extra footage on the DVD <laughs> release. Uh, what's the answer to that question? You guys are there. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, <coughs> it, was, it was such a trek putting together the film that we had, and there is so much other footage. And that Mike Watt thing, I loved that so much. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out like how to get that in, but it wasn't like there's no place for it. But that would be a great extra to have on that DVD thing, because that really <coughs> is fantastic. <laughs> it could it could be like an eight part series <laughs> on the History Channel. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, in the red. Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, woman musicians that uh, Kathleen looks up to right now. Yeah. Yeah, Katy Perry. Um, no, um, <laughs> it's so weird when people ask me to come up with anything that has to do with a list, you know what I mean? Because I have no idea. Um, I'm really into everything that my friend Bronte makes, um, all of his bands. He's not a woman, but I'm super into him. Um, and everybody from the band Gravy Train, I don't know if anybody knows that band. Um, but I'm totally in love with all of them and the art that they make. Women I look up to, God, there's just so many. I mean, I have like weird stuff with Cindy Lauper. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm really bad at like questions about like lists and names. All right, sir, down here in front. Uh, first, thank each of you for making a very honest movie. Rock documentaries usually are either over dramatic or dishonest. Kathleen, the film is about, is so personal, and at the same time, one of the things you seem to be saying is, I don't want you in here. I don't want you in here, but here I am. And that kind of back and forth. How did each of you weave that in the storytelling? Uh, so to uh, paraphrase the question, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the tension uh, between uh, you know, a, a feeling of I don't want you in here, but here I am, uh, being this push and pull of uh, the problem of making this kind of portrait. Uh, how did each of you uh, contend with this in making the film? I think that uh, Kathleen, you could probably answer this better than either of us, but I'll just say, I'll just say that, well, Kathleen's a friend of mine, and um, so I felt like I could ask her questions that maybe other people wouldn't dare to ask her, <laughs> you know, or that we could keep the conversation going. And um, I think part of, like, a lot of women that I, that speaking of women that I look up to, like a lot of women that I look up to, we are able to have conversations when things are a little bit difficult and to continue to stay present and have that conversation. And Kathleen really did that in the interviews, even if I was asking questions that were really hyper personal. Um, she showed up and stayed. And, you know, I was really, really grateful for that. So um, she made my job really easy in that. We actually talked a lot about the thing of feeling like you want to be seen, like you really want people to see you, but then feeling like you don't want to be seen because that's something, I'm really glad you picked up on that in the movie because in the beginning, Cindy and I talked a lot about how that's a big part of my personality and also how I think women are really afraid to step up and be seen because a lot of times um, people just want to drag you down and it's, it's really hard to, <clears throat> 
um, have this thing where when you get attention and people look at you, you feel like you're hurting other people's feelings. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's like, um, so there is this push and pull of like, well, I love fucking attention. I love attention. I'm like crying on the screen. Like, I fucking love it. And it's like, at the same time, I, I feel this thing of um, not just like, oh, celebrity privacy or something like that, but more like, I'm confused. I'm confused about wanting to be seen or not wanting to be seen. I'm scared of being seen. But Cindy made me. I, I, I just say one more thing yeah. to that, which was at the end of the film, what you guys saw when Kathleen was on the porch. Uh, that was like one of my favorite moments when uh, Kathleen was like, wait a minute, if I say like this, 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 and this, and I put it all together as my story as it is, like who would believe me? Like that was a real genuine moment of like an aha. And then the answer to follow that of just being like, duh, other women would believe me, you know? And so, I mean, that was our last day of shooting. And it's one of the last things in the film. So it did feel like this process, like this year long process. And I was watching, I, I was watching <coughs> Kathleen kind of come to conclusions in that moment. And that was super inspiring and super honest and just happening right there. So. Yes. Um, back to that same scene, I agreed that I felt like that really tied the whole thing together, the whole story together. Um, and I wonder, I think you also said, I don't know if I can phrase it correct, correctly, but you said something about, I can't just speak the truth, I have to negotiate with how the truth is going to be perceived. How have you seen males reacting to this um, exposure of a previously unseen male privilege in our society. Are you seeing an, an evolution in the right direction in that area? Uh, the question um, is, uh, uh, have you, uh, Kathleen, seen an evolution in uh, males' awareness of their own privilege uh, within our society um, since uh, you started to make art? You know, when I when I was first in a band, when I was in Bikini Kill, it was really hard because a lot of men in the punk scene were super resistant and super pissed off um, at us. And then there were also women who called us man haters um, and spit in our faces and were like super destructive or whatever. Um, but then when I started making a different kind of music, I saw a different kind of person. You know, like we really invited our own community to the table. Um, and that was a big change that I saw in Le Tigre. And also making dance music, you know, it, having people dance and having people enjoy each other felt really, really political and really thrilling. And um, I, I have seen a change, but also like I married the most awesome person in the whole universe who like has supported me through this horrible illness. So he's the person who I see all the time. And um, if other men are like him, I'm super psyched. <laughs> yes. Is this on? Yeah. Kathleen, how are you feeling right now? And um, also, <laughs> can we, um, are you feeling like you may be getting back on stage soon? I hope so. We just, well, Kenny's here from my band. We just finished mastering. Oh. Um, we're right at the end of our record. And I can finally tell people why it took two years um, to make it. But uh, when I get home from this, we're going to start practicing and see where my health is at. I'm feeling much better. I have like a second chance at my life. I'm so grateful. Um, it was really bad. And um, my band stood by me and let me practice when I could. And I sang when I felt well enough. And if I'll be able to do a complete set and get up in front of people, I don't know, but it's kind of exciting that I don't know, and I hope that I find out that I, I can. But thanks for waiting to see us perform. Kathleen, thank you for being becoming a superhero by saying heroes need help too. 
I just have one question. I mean, what took it? Why did it take six years for the diagnosis? Oh, that's a really good one. Yep. You know, um, when I said that thing about negotiating the truth, I really minimized my symptoms <clears throat> to myself and um, to doctors. I was really scared that, um, and I think this was in the film, that when I did tell a doctor all my symptoms, I wasn't believed. And a lot of people, especially women with Lyme disease, are um, diagnosed <coughs> extremely late and later than men because they minimize it and because they get dumped into the category of like fibromyalgia. Um, and I was diagnosed with like Crohn's and all these different things and I kept being like, that's not my symptom, that's not my symptom. And we plugged away, you know, we went from doctor to doctor to doctor and there were times where we were just exhausted and didn't look hard enough. So um, some of it was sexism, I have to say, that it, it took so long. To be perfectly honest, I think it was internalized sexism with me where I was minimizing things. And um, I was also embarrassed of my illness and um, wanted to hide it, even from my doctors. So um, I kept making excuses. Thank you. That was a really long answer. <laughs> that was too long. Hi, it's Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Um, thank you so much for doing that and sharing all that. It was Totally amazing. Um, I've never actually, like, I've never recognized myself in someone so much as just watching that movie and especially like sitting here with my husband and like crying. Um, I have a, I have a kind of a dorky question. The, the scene um, that also really resonated was all these people alone in their bedrooms. I was that teenage girl and I knew a lot of us. And back then we didn't have the internet. And you sort of started your band and you started in this place where there was no internet. I mean, you guys, you know, it was before that. Now you have it. Um, but it's also can be this really awful, shitty, mean place where people can still attack you like a lot more easily. So, I mean, I don't really know what the question is, but you've like straddled both eras and not necessarily is it better or worse, but like, how do you feel the pros and cons are now versus back then when it was just a bunch of people connecting and there wasn't the internet there to create this weird other layer? Um, I, I feel like the internet is a tool that can be used for good or evil. Um, <laughs> we were just talking about this today, actually. Um, I, I think it's, you know... It's like TV, how there's a million channels now. And when we were kids, like, um, The Wizard of Oz would be on and everybody would watch it. You know, and we'd all lay in front of the TV and we had this kind of common experience. I think that's something that, like, the Super Bowl provides for people now. Um, but I feel like there's so much stuff. Like, you can find, if you're, like, super into vacuum cleaning naked, you can find, like, a <laughs> chat room for that or a discussion group or whatever. And I feel like there's just so many little pockets of, of things that it was almost easier for us because there wasn't that stuff and it felt really new. And now that there's the internet, people like tend to isolate and be on the internet. You know what I mean? And like head snap from thing to thing. But I also, you know, don't believe in the idea that like the 90s were more authentic than now. I think now is super exciting. I think um, blogs can be really great and really funny. And um, I just don't read fucked up comments, like I just stop at the end of the article. I mean, occasionally you can't help it, but it's like, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, you know when good criticism is happening and what a gift that is, and um, you just have to be smart about it and believe in your heart. I believe in my heart. Thanks. Uh, what was it like to see the movie for the first time and to relive a lot of very personal experiences with both your work uh, and with your illness that came up? Um, it was really exciting for me to see the Bikini Kill footage because I'd never really watched 
it, and I was like, whoa, that's why people were reacting to us. Like, I did, when it was happening, I was like, why are people freaking out? You know what I mean? And then, like, I saw myself, like, you know, totally on stage, and I was like, oh, I get it now. You know what I mean? Because you, when you're in it, you don't, like, watch yourself on videotapes or whatever, and um, so that was really exciting for me to be able to have some distance from it and, and watch it. Um, it was kind of hard, like, every time that the illness part came up, I was like, oh, I gotta pee now, you know what I mean? Like, I really didn't you know, watch that part, but typically when I was watching it, I felt like it, I was a character in a movie, and I was, like, kind of from a distance. Like, it doesn't feel like me when it's, you know, when I'm watching it on, like, TV or on my computer, it felt like I was watching somebody else, kind of, go through this thing. I mean, I know it was me, I'm not nuts, but, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it feels, it's like, when I see myself on stage or something, like it just it feels like it was a different person. And it's not like I've changed. I'm not angry or anything. It's just it feels like Sasha Fierce. I don't know. <laughs> Do I? Uh... Yeah, oh, there's someone standing. Oh, there. oh great. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks. That was awesome. Um, I have a question about the kind of like a petri dish in Olympia that Bikini Kill grew out of and, and what that environment provided for you and your art and if there are differences or similarities between what girls who are starting punk bands and blogging or zines now, like, are there differences of, in what you are singing about or common trends um, and what girls should be singing about now that they're not singing about? Or writing about and thinking about. Sorry, it's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> or, or just like you could say the differences there culturally um, and what girls are facing now. Um, wow. Sorry, That's I'm huge. Excited, I'll so start with the petri dish part. Um, <laughs> Olympia for me was totally amazing because I always thought that rock stars were like on TV. And I saw Toby Bale, my bandmate, who was in a band called The Go Team, walk by on the street. And I was like, whoa, I just saw that person in a band and now they're walking by me and I'm in a coffee shop. And I was like, it just made me feel like I could do it. And K Records, I don't know if anybody knows about them, but K Records was in Olympia and they really redefined um, what punk could be and that punk didn't have to be a specific sound, it was an idea. And I've always believed that punk is an idea. Um, more than a genre, more than a musical genre. Um, I'm really excited that a lot of girls and women don't have to sing about um, gender stuff all the time and that they can sing about whatever the fuck they want. You know, a lot of my career has been thinking about what's the missing song and writing it. And with the new album that we wrote, I didn't think about that. I just let myself write whatever the fuck I wanted. And um, to have that freedom and to know that other women are having that freedom now is really amazing to me. I don't want Bikini Kill Jr. to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that already happened. And um, I don't judge other women for, like, not singing about sexism or not singing about racism or not singing about classism. Like, I don't think everybody has to do that. Like, that's something I really wanted to do. And... Um, I feel really proud of my bands, especially right now when they made this movie. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. You did. Thank you. I guess we've got the time for just a couple of more. Do we have anyone? Yes. Uh, well, this is this is just a, a, a congratulations uh, because uh, when I came to see this film, you know, I was expecting this music documentary, punk rock. I didn't expect this, this side about illness, and it really resonated with me, and I know a lot of women who have been through something like this, where it's, that it you know, distorts your relationship to your body, and uh, empties your bank account, and you know, you're told it's all in your head, so um, yeah, it was, really, it was really moving and touching and really unique to see this, this sort of thing. So just Thank you so much. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Do we have another? I, I, I don't know if everybody got to hear that, but it was sort of uh, congratulating on uh, expressing a story in which it was not merely, um, you know, one about uh, 
uh, punk rock and politics, uh, but uh, and and music, but also uh, about this illness, and the difficulty of dealing with that. Yes. Just another congratulations on, uh, <laughs> if you heard it, uh, uh, you know, the, I don't know. One, one last question, one last question. Yes. I think that this maybe is a good ender. Um, do you think that there's a fourth wave of feminism maybe kind of happening now with things like Pussy Riot Movement happening and those girls and then people like Tavi Gevinson who's starting, you know, like a blog for young girls trying to kind of push some of these ideas that you generated out to a whole new group of women that are growing up. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, it's totally happening. I mean, I think that feminism really goes in 20-year waves. Um, you know, a lot of women who were doing stuff in the 60s and 70s, it took them to, till the 90s to write their stories. And um, it took 20 years for my story to kind of be told or part of my story or a snapshot of my story. Um, but I, I totally believe in the new generation of feminists and I've met um, women who've criticized what we've done in a really productive way and said like, I, wanna, I don't wanna start Riot Girl again, I wanna start something new. Um, and I wanna build on what you guys did and what feminists um, in the 70s did and I wanna um, make it better and, and uh, take your mistakes and learn from it. And I love hearing that, I absolutely love it. And I, I really believe in the kids. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank you. Thank you.